So I spent the whole day. So I spent. So I spent the whole day yesterday, frustrated, angry, in a rage. Couldn't function properly. Couldn't think properly. Um, need to process things a lot slower. So. I'm doing the history of computers, the history of electricity, the history of the telephone system, the history of photography. I'm giving myself a year to do those. And I've, I'm doing a Tereo course, which finishes in, I can't remember what I posted, June, July next year. So this is all, all of these projects are going to take a year. They're all going to be divided into lots of time, which I've never done before. That, that I'm not angry at the, at the course itself. I'm angry that I've never uh, had a structure to my life, that I've never been able to organize paying bills, to um, put aside special time for cycling, special time for myself, special time for whatever. I've never done that before, so this is all a mess, but again, this will be a process over the next few years. Um, so I still want to finish off my Greek, and that's just... And all that is, is just the tables that are in this book into a spreadsheet or if it takes up too much time, just draw it on a bit of paper, make it bright and colorful with crayons or felt tips or whatever. Do it that way. Forget trying to do this elaborate thing in Flash that you started with a, dec ten, a decade ago, 10 years ago. Um, you made some really good ones. I don't know. But I can't open them in Flash anymore. I don't know why. Um, I'm using Flash on, on XP emulator. So there's no problems there. It just doesn't open up any um, any of the projects that I started doing back in 2004. So I want to finish off Greek. And I want to finish off Hebrew. So basically this is 1992 again, 1993. So I'm studying Greek, Hebrew, and Tereo, and a bit of Latin divided up. I mean, very Greek and Hebrew, very, very low priority. Just a project that I began and never finished. Well, all my projects have begun and never finished. So going through Gal Ripplinger's book, and comparing it to Constance Cumbie's book, that's a project that's 20, 30 years old that I will finish in a year's time, very slowly. Like a, a spreadsheet to divide my time up into... Sundays is Skyrim day. Sundays is Skyrim day. I've got that sorted. So, um, that that's going. That's working. That's in place. After nine is link time, which means uh, the Minish Cap, uh, Twilight Princess, Skyward Sword, which I'm, I'm getting on Thursday, uh, Link's Awakening, you know, Wind Waker, it's, it's link time. So a year to play through one, one Zelda game, or doesn't matter, as long as it's a bit every day towards an end goal and the ultimate end goal in a year's time is to finish all these Amiga games that I bought I didn't buy them that that came with my Amiga that were all um, not quite legal apart from obviously Theme Hospital and Warcraft and The Witcher they, they wouldn't run on an Amiga so I got Day of the Tentacle, Diablo White Eye of the Beholders, 
Fate of Atlantis, Temptress, Populous, Power Manga, um, Megalomania, all those games, I'm going to play them through. I'm going to give myself time to play them through. Uh, I'm still, so I, the Beholder, I'm still holding back till the next to the the walkthrough I was following was by a Anex necroscope 86 and he deleted his channel somebody's uploading his videos re-uploading his videos one by one and he has done fate of Atlantis I might have to start with that or Lord of the temptress Lord of the temptress I sold it um, at a at like a um, thrift store and I went back the next day and I made up a lie that it wasn't mine to sell so I got it back uh, I, that was a Windows that was yeah that wasn't mine and I don't know what ever happened to it but I must have given it back it was a Windows 3.1 version wasn't it I think so yeah one year to do the history of computing the history of um, microphones light bulbs, electricity, um, chemistry, physics, geography, no, <laughs> not too much, not too much. Just, the, this is the thing. I've got, my. I show, I open the episode with a dead Amiga, completely dead, stripped, all in bits. So over the year, that Amiga will have uh, a power supply this even the power supplies in bits so this is this is really cool because I, I really want to learn electronics so I'm putting it together piece by piece over the, the length of a year uh, I obviously prefer playing the games on uh, Steam and, and GOG rather than an original Amiga because I don't know this is so fussy but I have got a mod for mine to have a wireless mouse using a computer any computer even if it's an old Macintosh with with the mouse plugged in it, oh god I can't stand it anymore I bought my first wireless mouse it actually had a little dock and as long as the dock wasn't far away from the mouse you could use it it was weird but yeah wireless keyboards wireless mouse that that is where I'm at so it doesn't matter if I play these games on the original Amiga um, of course the DOS version I think these are the DOS version doesn't have a save function one or the other I can't remember which one a save function once you complete this game in two you can use your same characters to play through the second game so you start with like massive stamina and, and luck and all that strength and wisdom and whatever and I've never seen I don't think this even came out on the Amiga oh the Beholder 3 so that's the goal as soon as the necroscope upload or the person uploads the necroscopes uh, playthrough I will begin this project so I've got plenty of time to wait till they upload it so I just I've got uh, on the PlayStation I've got the Discworld. Uh, these are all point and yeah these are all point and click games that back in the 90s when I owned uh, not quite legal copies of them. I mean the, my Amiga came with this huge box. I've still got it. It's up there, um, full of of games, just tons and tons of games. Like, so it's it's something that I I did back then that I have to break through today. I would play because I had so many games. I would play one, get bored with it, move on to the next one. So I, I started playing all these games, and I never finished them. So we got we got cannon fodder to do, uh, Lotus Esprit Turbo, um, Civilization, Colonization, all those all those games. Um, round one then maybe I mean this is stupid but then you've got Command and Conquer uh, Warcraft Starcraft Age of Empires 1 2 3 4 5 I just bought I just bought Age of Empires 3 <laughs> I didn't know it existed 
an age of mythology i don't understand i've just bought that and it's not stupid i i, I remember like giving it away because it was a horrible stupid game but the one i've bought is it is basically just like age of empires there's no difference at all so I, I don't know why i didn't like it so yeah one year project to do new age bible versions greek hebrew tereo Um, diodes, transistors, resistors, capacitors, electronics, history of electricity, the history of computing, Alan Turing, um, Bab Charles Babbage, um, the female, yeah, obviously the females that never got credit or whatever, it's, you know, it's hard to track down who invented the things because the credit goes to whoever's got the more muscle power uh, so <laughs> trying to yeah trying to f hunt down who invented it rather than the person who's given credit for inventing it is difficult so obviously Nikapis Nikapis Nipreshe whatever his name is um, to get the Roundhay Garden scene came before Edison was even thinking about making motion film so you know a lot of lot of thievery suing people and stealing patents and and showing up at the at the patent office just before um what was it um my favorite hero sir, Ale sir alexander graham bell didn't invent the phone somebody else did but he reached the patent office first so he got the credit so the credit's going to go to the Richard Pierces of the inventors, the originals, and not the Wright brothers. The, act, the, the people that actually were the first, not those who get credit for being the first in the patent office or the Guinness Book Records or whatever. It's totally irrelevant. So for one example, which would be the hardest example for me, is I've just found out that somebody may have climbed Everest before Sir Ed and uh, they'll they haven't found his body but i'm willing if they well they didn't find his body at the top of the that's the car um so i'm willing to grant the actual inventors rather than those who get the credit even if it comes to sir ed which it won't because mount everest would have to would have to melt for all the dead bodies that's disgusting, I know. <laughs> Full of dead bodies to be found. Yeah, bye. Fukatakina. W H A K A. W H A K A. T A K I N A. That's not it. Fuckataki. Fuckataki. That's not what I'm looking for. W H A K A T A K I N A. Fuckataki. Fuckataki. Why aren't you giving me the other one? Fuckataki. Fuckataki. To go in search of, to search out Fokatakina, search the scriptures. Fokataki. 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 Nu mai hari mai, me. Mai te ke ara o paparoa. No mai hari mai. We'll do the whole thing. N a u m 
A I H E A R E M A I doesn't speak. Welcome. Welcome, come more. No mai hari mai. Kiti ara o papareo. Welcome to the pathway of papareo, te reo Māori. Māori. Foundation language program. Papa means foundation and the reo means language. This is your first kite. That's kit. Kit there. Kit. This is your first kit. Kofai aho. Who are you? Which means who am I? In this kit day kit, we have put together a number of resources to help you settle into your learning as quickly as possible and to show that you can have fun along the way. How to pronounce words. Your spring water kit contains fun activities. Your Kaitakai K I Oops K I K A I T I A K I Kaitiaki 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 Your Kaitiaki which is trusty minder guardian custodian will act as a guide to support supports his support person okay so I've got a huge run here Kofi aho Kowai aho who are you who are you Walk W H A K T A U K I Pokatoki 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 to utter a proverb. Kotoku reo kotoku ahu ah o u ho kotoku reo kotoku mapihi moria kotoku reo kotoku fakakai Narihi. My language, my awakening, my language, my growing desire within, my language, my ornamental grace. Fakarongo, I think, is listen. Pokorongo 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 She speaks too fast Pokorongo To listen, to hear, to obey Tit Titero 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 Titiro, to look at, inspect, examine, observe, view. So we've got listen, we've got view, and korero. K O R.
Korero. 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 To tell, say, speak, read, talk. I think we should learn how to pronounce the vowels instead of listening to it. Don't know. Mahire Hinengaro. Color Word Association. Kupu Hu. New words to learn. Pai Mahi. Let's work. Fukatu Hinengaro. Don't know how to pronounce that. Script time, hockey, mahara, recap. Here are some tips. Check your answers in the back of the spring water kit. What's that page nailed? Oh. Another big little. Hakina, breathe in. Haputa, breathe out. So that's on video. Skip that. Uh, another big long one. After my nap. Do that page. So here's the vowels R A E O U. R A E O U. That's short vowels. And how do you pronounce a long vowel? R A E O U. Doesn't say what a hat is. Oh, here R E E O U. It's the same one. A E E O U. So, what's this W H N G R stuff? W H Okay, just add an A Fa Fe Fi Fo Fu Wa Fa Fe Fi Fo Fu Na Ne Ni No Nu Na Ne Ni No Nu Ra Re Ri Ro Ru Ra Re Ri Ro Ru Okay Just do that over and over until you've learnt it Himahi, the words below each picture have the same spelling but different meanings. Some have lengthened vowel sounds and some don't. Circle the word that matches the picture. Waka, waka. Keke, keke, turu, turu. Aparo, aparo. Poro, poro. Peke, peke. Pene, pene. Karu, karu. Rakuraku. Rakuraku. Okay. Should be easy. Take a break. Go back to it. No worries. So there is a volume thing here. I've just upgraded it to the latest Scum VM. So I put these all on maximum and. Let's we'll see what that does. <coughs> Compliments of Danny, the lawnmower man. Hi, chickens. That's virtuosity, isn't it? Wrong movie. The house that rocks the cradle holds the hand. The hand that rocks the cradle, something like that. Little My Man was, yeah, in and of itself. Freaky! Still too quiet. I don't know what to do about that. Whoops. Desktop audio. Turn the that's me. Turn that off, turn that off. 
don't understand. to record it without me and boost the sound or turn you down right down to there so I have to boost the audio all right fine that's not playing at all help how do I get out of here Yeah, I've just bought three more games, I know. Ishar 1, Ishar 2, Ishar 3, and Crystals of Arborea. Never knew it existed, but that came out before Ishar. So, my first. Starting off the air with Lord of the Temptress, followed by Ishar. Right, right, right. Comparing PC to Amiga version, I don't know if you can do that these days. Seeing they're all played through GOG or Steam. We'll have to wait and see. Had to beat him to death with his own shoe. <sighs> Presents a virtual theatre production. Pull your toys away. The kingdom was at peace after decades of unrest. The king had uh, united his quarrelsome subjects now under his just rule, protected by the sea, and the mountains of evil prospered and the crops flourished. That's supposed to be in 640 by 480. That's why it's all stretched like that. There's the castle. Yes. King and his companions had visited our village while hunting, which gave me, Diamont, the chance of a few days of easy pickings as a beater. Okay, I should have known something. He wasn't a beef eater, he was a beater. What? What's the difference? <laughs> what the hell? I don't know. I've never seen the intro before. Must be the DOS version. An uprising and far off, I knew we were riding with the King's Guard. It was my first encounter with a Skorl. As Dawn's cold fingers reached into the sky, turn veil, morning vague forms drew near, we realised Sandland had rallied something. I'd be impatient. I found myself a prisoner. Oh, better read that. I was knocked unconscious when I fell to my terrified move at. Okay. So now the game starts. Oh, no, 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 no. What are you doing? What are you doing? Lock it. Close. Lock. 
Oh, hang on, you got to talk to Redford. Water, water, give me water. Okay. Go get him a bottle of water and you move that brick there, isn't it? Don't give the game away. Barrel open. There's a bottle. Get bottle. Open sack. Oh, you got to use a knife on it. Table. Okay, use bottle on barrel. Nothing. Okay, there's some gold there. You got to find a knife. Only that. Let's go talk to Radford. Where's the knife? We'll get there. Oh, examine. Where's some knife? Don't be impatient. We'll be back. Puna, Puna Kete, Puna Kete, Puna, wrong phone, Puna Kete, Puna. Punua. So it's not Puna, it's Punua. 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 Puna Manawa. Puna Manawa. Puna Manawa. Puna Manawa. Puna Manawa. Puna Manawa. Manawa. Puna Manawa. Manawa. Puna Manawa. Puna Manawa. Puna Manawa. Puna Manama. Puna Manawa. Puna Manawa. Puna Nam. Puna Manawa. Puna Nama. Puna Manawa. Puna Manawa. Puna Manawa. Puna Manawa. Punua. What the hell does it mean? P U N A. Whoops. P U. What the hell is it towing two P's for? Stupid phone. Punua. To Punua. 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 Punua, to well up flow, spring of water, well pull. So, well pull, kete. 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 Ruru Y. What? Ruru Y. Ruru Y. Okay, fine. 
kitty. So we've got spring water basket kit. Okay. Spring water basket on page one. Kowai Aho. Don't need to do that. Ko. 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 This one doesn't have an umbrella. Ko. 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 A particle with no English equivalent. So it's nothing. Why? I don't. Mm. What's wrong with this keyboard? <laughs> keyboard, get it? Why? Why? Who? Whom? So participle, who? Why? Why? A ho. 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 So, ko is nothing. Who? I me. Nothing I me. So that spring water basket. Nothing who me kill page one Tewa Nanga O Ata Ro Hang on Ayotia Roa Aotearoa 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 Wananga 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 It's got a dot on it Wananga 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 Wananga. 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 To meet, discuss, deliberate. So we're meeting to discuss Aotearoa. 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 Page five. Mihi. 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 Mehi, 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 mehi. Mehi, 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 Mihi mihi to greet pay tribute Kote Rio I te Takura No such word So nothing to Rio to nothing Fokoraro W H a A A R O Fakaro 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 Marama Uh Fakaro to think, plan, consider. Mar Ma Marama. Marama is moon. 
Marama. Marama. To be clear, light, easy, lucid. Marama. 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 So if we type in translate, uh, what was it? Thai Kura. Something to do with the rock. No such word. Takura is one of the sons of Kupe. Takura was transformed into a into a rock to protect him from being beaten by a sea monster as he swam to the shore. Today, Takura represents stewardship. Over vulnerable creatures. Okay. Cool. Although the advent of film as an artistic medium is not clearly defined, the commercial, public screening of ten of Lumiere Brothers' short films in Paris on the 28th of December 1895 can be regarded as the breakthrough of projected cinematographic motion pictures. There had been earlier cinematographic results and screenings by others, but they lacked either the quality, financial backing, stamina or the luck to find the momentum that propelled the cinematograph Lumiere into a worldwide success citation needed. Soon film production companies and studios were established all over the world. The first decade of motion picture saw film moving from a novelty to an established mass entertainment industry. The earliest films were in black and white, under a minute long, without recorded sound and consisted of a single shot from a steady camera. Conventions toward a general cinematic language developed over the years with editing, camera movements and other cinematic techniques contributing specific roles in the narrative of films. Special effects became a feature in movies since the late 1890s, popularized by George Melly's fantasy films. Many effects were impossible or impractical to perform in theatre plays and thus added more magic to the experience of movies. Technical improvements added length reaching 60 minutes for a feature film in 1906, synchronised sound recording mainstream since the end of the 1920s, colour mainstream since the 1930s, and 3D mainstream in theatres in the early 1950s and since the 2000s. Sound ended the necessity of interruptions of title cards, revolutionised the narrative possibilities for filmmakers, and became an integral part of movie making. Popular new media, including television, mainstream since the 1950s, home video mainstream since the 1980s, and internet mainstream since the 1990s influenced the distribution and consumption of films. Film production usually responded with content to fit the new media, and with technical innovations, including widescreen mainstream since the 1950s, 3D and 4D film, and more spectacular films to keep theatrical screenings attractive. Systems that were cheaper and more easily handled, including 8mm film, video and smartphone cameras, allowed for an increasing number of people to create films of varying qualities, for any purpose including home movies and video art. The technical quality was usually lower than that of professional movies, but improved with digital video and affordable high-quality digital cameras. Improving over time, digital production methods became more and more popular during the 1990s, resulting in increasingly realistic visual effects and popular feature-length computer animations. Different film genres emerged and enjoyed variable degrees of success over time, with huge differences between for instance horror films mainstream since the 1890s newsreels prevalent in US cinemas between the 1910s and the late 1960s musicals mainstream since the late 1920s and pornographic films experiencing a golden age during the 1970s. Contents 1 before 1895 1.1 1 1878 in Earth. One six eight twin, twenty one external links before eighteen ninety five. Main article Precursors of Film. Film as an art form has drawn on several earlier traditions in the fields such as oral storytelling, literature, theatre, and visual arts. Forms of art and entertainment that had already featured moving and or projected images include Shadowgraphy, probably used since prehistoric times. Shadow puppetry, possibly originated around two hundred BCE in Central Asia, India, Indonesia, or China. Camera obscura, a natural phenomenon that has possibly been used as an artistic aid since prehistoric times, and in the early 19th century led to the chemical capture of its images in still photography. Magic lantern, developed in the 1650s, preceded by some incidental and or inferior projectors. 
stroboscopic, persistence of vision, animation devices, phonacostocope since 1832, zoetrope since 1866, flip book since 1868. Some ancient sightings of gods and spirits may have been conjured up by means of concave mirrors, camera obscura or unknown projectors. By the 16th century, necromantic ceremonies and the conjuring of ghostly apparitions by charlatan, magicians, and witches seemed commonplace. The very first magic lantern shows seem to have continued this tradition with images of death, monsters and other scary figures. Around 1790, this practice was developed into a type of multimedia ghost show known as Phantasmagoria that was much more accessible since it was usually advertised as scientifically produced apparitions to prove that ghosts were not real. These very popular shows could feature mechanical slides, rear projection, mobile projectors, superimposition, dissolves, live actors, smoke sometimes to project images upon odors, sounds and even electric shocks. While the first magic lantern images seemed to have been intended to scare audiences, soon more subjects appeared and the lantern was used not only for storytelling, but for education as well. In the 19th century, a number of new and popular magic lantern techniques were developed, including dissolving views and several types of mechanical slides that created dazzling abstract effects, chromotrope, etc. All that showed, for instance, falling snow, or the planets and their moons revolving. Citation needed. Stroboscopic animation displayed short looping motion and was usually intended for entertainment, with surprising and often comical drawings. Occasionally the technique was used for scientific demonstration, for instance by physiologist Jan Perkin to show the beating of a heart and physicist Johann Heinrich Jakob Müller published a set of eight discs depicting several wave motions of sound, air, water, etc. Inventor Joseph Plateau supposed it could be adapted for use in Phantasmagoria and in 1847 magician Ludwig Dobler used his Phantascope to project animated acrobats, jugglers and dancers for a segment of his show that toured very successfully through several European cities. 1878-1895 Chronophotography and Early Animated Recordings Abe Edgington, owned by Leland Stanford, driven by C. Marvin, trotting at a 2-24 gate over the Palo Alto track, the 15th of June 1878. Early photographic sequences, known as chronophotography, lacked any serious narrative form. Most of these sequences were not initially intended to be viewed in motion and were instead presented as a serious, even scientific, method of studying movement. The sequences almost exclusively involved humans or animals performing a simple movement in front of the camera. Starting in 1878 with the publication of the Horse in Motion Cabinet Cards, photographer Edward Mybridge began making hundreds of chronophotographic studies of the motion of animals and humans in real time. He was soon followed by other chronophotographers like Etienne Jules Marie, Georges Demony, and Audemars Anschutz. In 1879, Mybridge started lecturing on animal locomotion and used his zoopraxiscope to project animations of the contours of his recordings traced onto glass discs. Long after the introduction of cinema, Mybridge's recordings would occasionally be animated into very short films with fluid motion relatively often the footage can be presented as a loop that repeats the motion seamlessly. In 1887, Ottomar Anschutz started presenting his chronophotographic recordings as animated photography on a small milk glass screen and later in peepox automats. For public presentations of the short electrodicoscope loops, he started recording adding topics that were more amusing than the usual motion studies, such as wrestlers, dancers, acrobats, scenes of everyday life, two carpenters breakfasting, family eating from a single bowl, boys fighting, card players, two men taking a pinch of snuff, lathering up at the barbers. Some scenes probably depicted staged comical scenes and many may have directly influenced later films by the Edison Company, such as Fred Ott's Sneeze. In 1893, Edison introduced the long-awaited Pintoscope, with looped film strips in a peak box viewer that could last for about half a minute before starting over. Many of these movies showed well-known vaudeville acts performing in Edison's Black Maria studio. 1892-1895, Early Screenings Emile Reynaud exploited his theatre optic, optical theatre, patented in 1888 between the 28th of October 1892 to March 1900 with over 12,800 shows to a total of over 500,000 visitors at the Musée Grévin in Paris. His pantomimes Luminoises were a series of animated stories that included Paul the Piero and Autour d'un Cabin. On 25, 29 and the 30th of November 1894, Anschutz presented his pictures on a large screen in the darkened Grand Auditorium of a post office building in Berlin. From the 22nd of February to the 30th of March 1895, a commercial one, five-hour program of 40 different scenes was screened for audiences of 300 people at the Old Reichstag and received circa 4,000 visitors. The Berlin Wintergarten Theatre hosted an early movie presentation by the Skladanovsky brothers during the month of November 1895. Their circa 15 minutes picture show was part of an evening program that lasted over three hours, which further included all kinds of variety acts. The Skladanovskys showed eight short films, circa 6 to 11 seconds if played at 16 fps, looped repeatedly, while a specially composed score was played especially loud to drown out the noise of the machinery. The Apotheos film showed the brothers entering the frame from opposite sides in front of a white background, bowing towards the camera as if receiving applause and walking out of the frame again. When their show was finished they replicated the action in person in front of the projection screen. The popular venue was filled to capacity with circa 1500 rich patrons for each evening program, but not all of them watched the films. The bioscope was reportedly well received with extensive applause and flowers thrown at the screen. However, the Berlin papers were seldom critical of our shows due to the revenue of the theatre advertisements they placed. The Lumiere brothers gave their first commercial screening with the Cinematograph in Paris on the 28th of December 1895. 
they favored actuality films, as truthful documents of the world they lived in, but their show also included the staged comedy La Rosa Arrows. During the next 10 years, their company sent cameramen all around the world to shoot films, which were exhibited locally by the cameramen, and then sent back to the company factory in lines to make prints for sale to whoever wanted them. There were nearly a thousand of these films made up to 1901, nearly all of them actualities. 1896-1905, novelty attraction, cheap entertainment, early industry. Main article, silent film. The novelty of realistic moving photographs was enough for a motion picture industry to blossom before the end of the century in countries around the world. The cinema was to offer a relatively cheap and simple way of providing entertainment to the masses. Filmmakers could record performances, which then could be shown to audiences around the world. Travelogues would bring the sights of far-flung places, with movement, directly to spectators' hometowns. Movies would become the most popular visual art form of the late Victorian age. In the years that followed, the art of the motion picture quickly went from a novelty act to an established large-scale entertainment industry. Films evolved from a single shot, completely made by one person, sometimes with a few assistants, towards pictures that were several minutes in length and consisted of several shots and a narrative, citation needed. Films were mostly screened inside temporary storefront spaces, intenser traveling exhibitors at fairs, or as dumb, acts in vaudeville programs. During the first years, a film would often be under a minute long and would usually present a single scene, authentic or staged, of everyday life, a public event, a sporting event or a short slapstick gag. There was little to no cinematic technique, the film was usually black and white and it was without sound, citation needed. It became the practice for the producing companies to sell prints outright to the exhibitors, at so much per foot, regardless of the subject. Typical prices initially were 15 cents a foot in the United States, and one shilling a foot in Britain. Hand-colored films, which were being produced of the most popular subjects before 1900, cost two to three times as much per foot. Some producers did not sell their films, but exploited them solely with their own exhibition units. To enhance the viewer's experience, silent films were commonly accompanied by live musicians in an orchestra, a theater organ, and sometimes sound effects and even commentary spoken by the showman or projectionist. Although projection soon proved to be the more successful format, peep box movie viewers were not abandoned right away. W.K.L. Dixon left Edison's company in 1895 to exploit his mutoscope with much success. His company continued production for the viewers until 1909, but also developed the Biograph projector. In 1896, they started to compete with Edison and the many others who engaged in the new market of film screening, production and distribution. The American Mutoscope and Biograph Company was the most successful motion picture company in the United States for a while, with the largest production until 1900. George Méliès left painting a backdrop in his studio. The iconic image from La Voyage dans la Lune, 1902. Beginning in 1896, magician Georges Méliès started producing, directing, and distributing an oeuvre that would eventually contain over 500 short films. He realized that film afforded him the ability to produce visual spectacles not achievable in the theater. He made extensive use of the stock trick and is often regarded as the godfather of special effects. He built one of the first film studios in May 1897. By 1898 Méliès was the largest producer of fiction films in France and his output consisted mostly of fiction films featuring trick effects, which were very successful in all markets. The special popularity of his longer films, which were several minutes long from 1899 onwards, while most other films were still only a minute long, led other makers to start producing longer films. J. Stuart Blackton and magician Albert E. Smith started the Vitagraph Company of America in 1897. By 1907, it was one of the most prolific American film production company, producing many famous silent films. The first rotating camera for taking panning shots was built by British pioneer Robert W. Paul in 1897, on the occasion of Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. He used his camera to shoot the procession in one shot. His device had the camera mounted on a vertical axis that could be rotated by a worm gear driven by turning a crank handle, and Paul put it on general sale the next year. Shots taken using such a panning head were also referred to as panoramas in the film catalogues. In England, pioneers Robert Paul, James Williamson and G.A. Smith and other producers were joined by Cecil Hepworth in 1899, and in a few years he was turning out 100 films a year, with his company becoming the largest on the British scene. From 1900 Charles Pathé began film production under the Pathé Frere brand, with Ferdinand Zecker hired to actually make the films. By 1905, Pathé was the largest film company in the world, a position it retained until World War I. Leon Gorman began film production in 1900, with his production supervised by Alice Guy. 1905-1914, Innovation and Early Storytelling The first successful permanent theatre showing nothing but films was The Nickelodeon, which was opened in Pittsburgh in 1905. By this date there were finally enough films several minutes long available to fill a program running for at least half an hour, and which could be changed weekly when the local audience became bored with it. Other exhibitors in the United States quickly followed suit, and within a couple of years there were thousands of these Nickelodeons in operation. The American situation led to a worldwide boom in the production and exhibition of films from 1906 onwards. Movie theaters became popular entertainment venues and social hubs in the early 20th century, much like cabarets and other theaters. Until 1927, most motion pictures were produced without sound. This period is commonly referred to as the silent era of film. 
In most countries, intertitles came to be used to provide dialogue and narration for the film, thus dispensing with narrators, but in Japanese cinema, human narrators known as Benshi remained popular throughout the silent era. The technical problems were resolved by 1923, citation needed. Illustrated songs were a notable exception to this trend that began in 1894 in vaudeville houses and persisted as late as the late 1930s in film theaters. Lit performance or sound recordings were paired with hand-colored glass slides projected through stereopticons and similar devices. In this way, song narrative was illustrated through a series of slides whose changes were simultaneous with the narrative development. The main purpose of illustrated songs was to encourage sheet music sales, and they were highly successful with sales reaching into the millions for a single song. Later, with the birth of film, illustrated songs were used as filler material preceding films and during real changes. Advancement of film language. The execution of Mary Stewart, produced by the Edison Company for viewing with the kinetoscope, showed Mary Queen of Scots being executed in full view of the camera. The effect was achieved by replacing the actor with a dummy for the final shot. The technique used in the film is seen as one of the earliest known uses of special effects in film. George Méliès also utilized this technique in the making of Escamotage and Dame Shay Robert Howden, The Vanishing Lady. The woman is seen to vanish through the use of stop-motion techniques. A scene in set inside a circular vignette showing up during vision in Santa Claus 1899. The other basic technique for tricks in cinematography was the double exposure of the film in the camera. This was pioneered by George Albert Smith in July 1898 in England. The set was draped in black, and after the main shot, the negative was re-exposed to the overlaid scene. His The Corsican Brothers was described in the catalogue of the Warwick Trading Company in 1900, by extremely careful photography the ghost appears quite transparent. After indicating that he has been killed by a sword thrust, and appealing for vengeance, he disappears. A uh, vision then appears showing the fatal jewel in the snow. G.A. Smith also initiated the special effects technique of reverse motion. He did this by repeating the action a second time, while filming it with an inverted camera, and then joining the tail of the second negative to that of the first. The first films made using this device were Tipsy, Topsy, Turby and the Awkward Sign Painter. The earliest surviving example of this technique is Smith's The House That Jack Built, made before September 1900. Cecil Hepworth took this technique further, by printing the negative of the forwards motion backwards frame by frame, so producing a print in which the original action was exactly reversed. To do this he built a special printer in which the negative running through a projector was projected into the gate of a camera through a special lens giving a same size image. This arrangement came to be called a projection printer, and eventually an optical printer. The use of different camera speeds also appeared around 1900 in the films of Robert W. Paul and Hepworth. Paul shot scenes from on a runaway motor car through Piccadilly Circus, 1899 with the camera turning very slowly. When the film was projected at the usual 16 frames per second, the scenery appeared to be passing at great speed. Hepworth used the opposite effect in The Indian Chief and the Sidelets Powder, 1901. The Chief's movements are sped up by cranking the camera much faster than 16 frames per second. This gives what we would call a slow motion effect, citation needed. Film editing and continuous narrative. The first films to consist of more than one shot appeared toward the end of the 19th century. A notable example was the French film of The Life of Jesus Christ, La Vie du Christ the Birth, The Life and the Death of Christ by Alice Guy. These weren't represented as a continuous film, the separate scenes were interspersed with lantern slides, a lecture, and live choral numbers, to increase the running time of the spectacle to about 90 minutes. Another example of this is the reproductions of scenes from the Greco-Turkish War, made by Georges Magnès in 1897. Although each scene was sold separately, they were shown one after the other by the exhibitors. Even Melly's Cinderella, of 1898 contained no action moving from one shot to the next one. To understand what was going on in the film the audience had to know their stories beforehand, or be told them by a presenter. The two scenes making up come along, do. Real film continuity, involving action moving from one sequence into another, is attributed to British film pioneer Robert W. Paul's Come Along, do. Made in 1898 and one of the first films to feature more than one shot. In the first shot, an elderly couple is outside an art exhibition having lunch and then follow other people inside through the door. The second shot shows what they do inside. Paul's Cinematograph Camera No. 1, of 1895 was the first camera to feature reverse cranking, which allowed the same film footage to be exposed several times and thereby to create superpositions and multiple exposures. This technique was first used in his 1901 film Scrooge, or Marley's Ghost. The further development of action continuity in multi-shot films continued in 1899 at the Brighton School in England. In the latter part of that year, George Albert Smith made The Kiss in the Tunnel. This film started with a shot from a phantom ride, at the point at which the train goes into a tunnel, and continued with the action on a set representing the interior of a railway carriage, where a man steals a kiss from a woman, and then cuts back to the phantom ride shot when the train comes out of the tunnel. A month later, the Bamforth Company in Yorkshire made a restaged version of this film under the same title, and in this case they filmed shots of a train entering and leaving a tunnel from beside the tracks, which they joined before and after their version of the kiss inside the train compartment. 1900-1909 The first two shots of a scene through a telescope 1900 with a telescope POV simulated by the circular mask. In 1900, continuity of action across successive shots was definitively established by George Albert Smith and James Williamson, who also worked in Brighton. 
In that year, Smith made a scene through a telescope, in which the main shot shows a street scene with a young man tying the shoelace and then caressing the foot of his girlfriend, while an old man observes this through a telescope. There is then a cut to close shot of the hands on the girl's foot shown inside a black circular mask, and then a cut back to the continuation of the original scene. Even more remarkable is James Williamson's 1900 film, Attack on a China Mission. The film, which film historian John Barnes later described as having the most fully developed narrative of any film made in England up to that time, opens as the first shot shows Chinese boxer rebels at the gate, it then cuts to the missionary family in the garden, where a fight ensues. The wife signals to British sailors from the balcony, who come and rescue them. The film also used the first reverse angle cut in film history. I think... Uh... Going legal is a choice these days, and I've chosen to go legal. Um, not that it matters, because Nintendo is the only one suing people for selling NES games and SNES games and illegal websites selling, downloading GameCube games, Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color. It's all relevant now. I've got, I've got a Game Boy Advance cartridge with three hundred and sixty-nine games on it, and the DS, the DS one is. I mean, again, that's not legal. Where is it? I mean, even even that's not legal. So what do we got? Uh, Two hundred and eight. Uh, do you work a webcam these days? I don't know. 208 games in one, on one cartridge. So I've taken that cartridge and I've stuck all the uh, other DS games that I like and taken off. I've put them on the hard drive. All the garbage that, that came on that. So going legal. So if we type in scum. So to go illegal, I've got oh god, I've had this for years. So beneath a steel sky. So the legal copy I've got is the CD32 version. Um, it's selling for seven hundred dollars on eBay right now, and I'm not gonna. I'm not selling it. It's not something I want to sell. Dark Forces, of course, I haven't finished Dark Forces yet. That's all in my Beneath a Steel Sky case. Legal copy of Eye of the Beholder 2. This is the Commodore Amiga version. Yep. So there's two. I mean, I bought this in an op shop years ago. If you buy these things on eBay or Amazon, you, you, just people are asking stupid prices so the thing with me is I've kept all my, some of the boxes my Doom boxes, Dark Forces, Command and Conquer Red Alert, Aftermath, blah 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 I've kept the boxes if, if the, the stuff that I've got if you were to purchase it these days you'd have to sell your car to buy them so illegal copies of Beneath the Steel Sky, Day of the Tentacle, Curse of Monkey Island King's Quest 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, Loom, Lure of the Temptress, Manic Mansion, Police Quest 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, Monkey Island again, Summon the Source of 1 and 2, Space Quest 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, Zach McCracken, so all that. Um, so I'm trying to, I'm going to replace all those illegal copies with GOG because when you go to sites where you can download it illegally it has a GOG link on it for I suppose for legal reasons so I suppose if GOG own the the rights to the game that maybe that's what's happened so Peter Molyneux and Sid Meier and that have signed over the rights to GOG or something anyway so we're gonna start this one year project off with the game I've never finished, Lure of the Temptress. Let's see if there's any sound first. 
See, it loads ScumVM anyway, so I can delete all my illegal copies of LUT, as they used to call it. L O T T, a LUT. There is no sound. Oh, we're doing the PC version, not the Amiga version. I have something to do with it. Oh, the sound. Yay! Not very loud though. Why is that not very loud? Hang on, I'll be back. There's no way you can do it then.
guitar distortion unit. Distortion is something we try very hard to eliminate in hi-fi amplifiers, but guitarists love adding a bit of distortion to make their music sound a bit different. What does it do? When you play an electric guitar, a signal is induced into an electromagnetic pickup mounted immediately under the string. When the string is plucked or struck, it vibrates strongly. At first, then dies away. This is called decay. The frequency remains the same, but the vibration decreases over time. The signal generated by the pickups is normally a quite faithful reproduction of the acoustic note created within the hollow body of the guitar, except that most monoelectric guitars don't produce any acoustic note because they are solid. Ha <laughs> ha. The guitar output signal is usually a fairly low level, about 50-somethings or so, and requires a significant amount of amplification to enable it to be heard. It is almost also mostly a fundamental tone, approaching a sine wave in pattern. Because of this, there isn't much in the way of harmonics or multiples of a fundamental tone in the signal. Between the guitar and the amplifier, we can play a few tricks with the signal to make it sound quite different. One of these tricks is distortion. In this case, we deliberately create a third harmonic of the original signal and add it back in, creating a note which sounds rather harsher than the original. At the same time, we can introduce some sustain effect which keeps the signal at much the same level for much of the time that, that the guitar string is vibrating, even though the sound level is decaying away. A depth control trim pot changes the sustain threshold signal level and the amount of distortion produced. One guitar distortion unit PC board, two SPDT slider switches, two 6x6.35 mm PC mount jack sockets, two PC stakes. Yum yum. Waka. Waka. Canoe. Waka. Waka. Canoe. Waka. Waka. Canoe. Waka. Waka. Canoe. Take. Prohibits it. Persons entering in or on federal property may take photographs of a kiki. Occupied by it's not cake. Kiki. Kiki. Cake. Kiki. Cake. Kiki. Cake. Kiki. Cake. Kiki. 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 Turu. Of the occupying agency concern. And C. Building entrances, lobbies, foyers. Corridors or auditoriums for news purposes. Tudu. Moon. Oh. Tudu. Tudu is a chair, stool. Tudu. 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 Apro, 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 Poro, 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 no, that's not a ball, it's right down the bottom. Poro, 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 Poro. 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 Yeah, no shit, you're not an attorney. But you're also not a news agency. You're not a freedom fighter. And you're certainly not standing up for anybody's First Amendment rights. Thank you. No, thank <clears throat> And you're a bona fide fucking idiot. S bag. Thank you. Thank you, bag. Thank you. Thank you, bag. Thank you. Thank you, bag. Take it. bag. Take it. bag. Penny. Penny. 
No, that's not a pen. Penne. Penne. Pen sheep. Oh. Penne. Penne. Pen pencil. 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 Karu. Karu. I. Karu. Karu. I. Karu. Karu. I. Karu. Karu. I. Karu. 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 I. R A. K U. R A K U. Raku 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 To scratch scrape nuts Guitar so verb is to scratch or scrape. Noun is guitar. Bye. Okay, so basically I've lost three days just trying to open this guitar distortion packet. Okay, so basically I've just wasted four days. So basically... So basically I've just wasted four days after purchasing this guitar distortion kit. It's wasted four days of my life. I've had anxiety attacks, panic attacks, anger fits, frustration, burning me, just hatred, abuse, just horrible. Being able to do nothing except watch videos, DVDs, because I can't focus on anything it's pissing me off it's frustrating like I have a learning block and I I can't only go so fast and not faster so I'm not fast enough for the world so the world's putting pressure on me to go faster and I can't because I'm taking my time 
but I'm so bloody slow. So I'm not fit for the world. <sighs> oh, I can't even find my phone anymore. What just... So this all began on Thursday. I bought this. It's now Monday. And it's got the line here. Um, begin by installing PC stakes for 12 volt and 0 volt supply. So nothing's labelled. It, it comes with everything to do with resistors, capacitors, diodes, fuses, Arduinos. What do you call them? Am Arpeggios? Oh, I don't give a crap right now. It's a word that penemitators have a fucking whatever. Um, <laughs> now I'm so angry I'm laughing. So par parameter, I don't give a shit. Um, so there's nothing in in the ins this or the instructions or the PDF file which I closed down out of frustration. That shows you what a PC stake is and I spent the last three hours just trying to Google what a PC stake is and I found it by accident but I can't find the thing that I found it on whether it was a PDF or a, or a website or what I don't know I have no idea because I can never find it again so I've just figured out after four days of owning this and not being able to open the packaging because I got stunk, stuck on this word stakes I figured out that these small I figured out that these small golden things are the stakes only by accident because the stakes that I found on the internet were yellow so I opened nothing I don't know what I'm saying I'm a bit my brain is foggy I searched this packet for something that looked like a steak and I couldn't find it in any of these and then as I put the package down I found these things so tomorrow day five of owning this I can open the packet and it's going to be downhill from here but the the just just the crippling the just the whole thing makes me bedridden it it plots me into bed and I can't even speak properly now it something's me into bed and I can't do anything I can't focus on anything I can't read anything and for me to not be able to read something is 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 a nightmare that would be my worst nightmare not having anything to read so frustrated pissed off and it's nearly time to buy this week's one <gasps> no I'm not, I'm not gonna buy another one till I finish this one I don't know it's all easy now but it's been a freaking pain in the ass I hate the freaking yeah. so I've uninstalled all the too many versions of each game versions and just put in the basics let's see if Lure of the Temptress has a better sound if you go options volume let's see if it's any louder Um, yes, it's in a different position all the time because we 
Oh my god! It's much louder. So what's wrong with GOG then? Cheap dull coin. Alright, fine. Now, use the bottle on the barrel. Nothing happened. What? Open. Use the bottle on the barrel. Free Redcliffe. Well, technically, that is still bouncing light that is causing that shadow. And just to entertain the thought, check this out. I'm going to bounce the shadow by placing a yellow block in the water instead of putting my finger in the air. Oh, what happened? The end point here is that there is no evidence that states the phases of the Hello? prove that Earth is a globe. No, but a lunar eclipse does, which really is the Earth's shadow. Open there. Look at that. Beautiful, isn't it? I would love to see Carl oh. Adams' explanation for that. However, in 2009, Leather cord, there we go. Use knife on leather cord. Rat pouch. I'm Rat pouch, your loyal servant. Here's an interesting science daily article where you can go and read about 
I tell him to use the bottle, I think. No, 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 sorry. Oh yeah, I'm not through the yet. Tell use bottle on barrel and then finish. Tell them to use bottle Before he continues, on this barrel is a geometric and then finish. Assuming that there is no atmosphere at all. Ah uh ha, -huh, he's stuck in there. Ah ha 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 ha. Did you do anything? Tell him to use bottle on arrow. This is far from conclusive. <laughs> There's also land beyond those oil rigs, and what are they all of a sudden being blocked by from the bottom up? Check out this clip from Al K, who shows us how refraction and the apparent. Nothing happens. Alright, so we're going to try a very simple looming demonstration. Tell them to operate. I've got two pieces of blue tack stuck to the side of it. No. The first one's just in line near the edge, and the first layer of this piece in the red, but it's 
Mm. Oh. What, what door? Hmm. Towards the center of I don't want to cheat. Of course, the, the globe is said to be a globe, a sphere. There is a pole. Oh, a gourd just means coin. Right now, asking whether or not. So I've got to find the tech now. against the squirrel. Find the blacksmith. Tell him I sent you. I was considering retiring the Flat Earth Fell compilations after the 10th edition. I wasn't 100% sure that it would be The girl is in danger. Traitor in the village. all of you and the decision was unanimous. The Flat Earth Fell compilations will stay. So this is Flat Earth Fell in the fire. Hello all and welcome along to another episode of Flat Earth Friday with me, Simon Dan. Thank you very much for joining me. Yes, the Flat Earth fails are Slip the course material and I see content spill out. Old no pungent smell, Johnson. lavender. There seems to be wow. a little bit confused. Nathan runs the Flat Earth and Globe Discussion Facebook group, which now boasts close to 40,000 members. At first, I was extremely skeptical because I thought this was the craziest idea Some, I'd ever okay. heard, and I was going to debunk it in five minutes. Pull. And after about a month of not sleeping, a little slight and movement. really just digging through the information, Push. I was a flat earther. That was Nathan being interviewed about two years ago on someone else's channel. Oh, okay. And he was talking about Sorry. the process of him coming Tell to be a flat earther. To and push him, he came round to the idea bricks. in about a month. Or did he? This was Nathan on his own channel about a month ago. 
some videos of it, and I, you know, I just, it, it was real simple. Yeah, yeah. it clicked for me in a couple days. It didn't take long, it took very long. Only a couple of days? So which is it, Nathan? A month or a couple of days? Something very fishy is going on here. And after about a month of not sleeping and really just digging through the information, I was a flat earther. Yeah, it clicked for me in a couple of days. I think I'll just right. a bit further. Stay tuned for that. Our next fail comes from Dean Wright. Forgot about that, but... How come you didn't fall down? What's in there? What I want to know is, can you save them? F5, control F5. F5. Oh, okay. Enter. No. Look in there. One, two, three. So if we quit and go back into it, we're playing the real version or the stolen version? Load. Oh, load save state. Okay, I've had Scum VM for 40 years and 20 years and 10 years and never figured out what it does. Cool. Time to do some singing. So I'm just curious about how much better the Amiga version is. Okay, it's got four discs. I got. I, I've I've owned this for years and I've never used it, so got a bit confused yesterday. You just um, swap discs on the fly. This is not my version. This is the. Uh, when you ate, you know, whatever you call it. WHD load or something. This is cracked by Fairlight. Yay, most of my games that I owned, owned, <laughs> most of the games that came with my Amiga are um, cracked by Fairlight or Scoopix. I mean, that's why Fearlight being a, a part of DaVinci Resolve is kind of cool, because it's just like, okay, so this is the hacking uh, side of your program, is it? <laughs> Alright, so has it got an intro? Has it got anything? It's uh, running in real time, so... Don't be so impatient. Remember, you used to use an Amiga thinking how super fast it was. Oh, gosh. Oh, I love the music. It's much better. Uh, I suppose it means just two. So if you've got all the WHD load versions, why are you buying them from GOG Games? It's a moral issue. 
I don't know. I just want a legal copy. I just want to own one legal copy of all the games that I'm playing in my one year project. Like I said, Sega don't care. Commodore don't care. Cloento does care, which is why I own all the Cloento software, which is right there. If you think of the graphics, I like the graphics better, eh? I like the... Yeah, because you grew up with these graphics. They're familiar to you. Yeah. Close. Lock. Oh, we go. Prisoner. Features he is close to death. A cloth pouch hangs from his belt. Oh, pickpocket a dead guy. Water, water, give me water. Okay, let's go get rat pouch. I will be playing this game all the way through. I mean, for me, after 20 years, that's uh, a bit of an achievement. Bottle get. Uh, use knife. Okay. A cheap dull coin, which the walkthrough calls a gourd. Or something. I'm not using the walkthrough. I'm not. I'm not. I'm only as as if as a a very very last resort. Use leather. Could. Yeah, it's not exactly the most accurate way of measuring. Thank you. Thank you. Come and move some bricks for me. It's the only advantage of um, Discworld. Nobody gets in anybody's way. Tap. Look at, I suppose you have to look at it first. To find the tap. Mm -hmm. Use bottle on tap. I think it was seven discs. I don't know why it didn't. I don't understand. I must have given it back to. I don't know. How's it going to drink it if his hands are tied up? And this one looks slightly too small. What is your name? Wolf. Well, wolf. Wolf. How can I help you? Where are the blacksmith? What should I say? That she's in danger. The girl is in danger. I wonder if that means a princess. I've owned this game for 30 years and I've never got past the escaping the prison but... <laughs> Ah, and then he dies. So use the knife on his pouch. Rob, rob the dead man. Okay, bricks. Look at bricks. Hey, red pouch is closed. Duller. <gasps> it doesn't look like this on a real Amiga. I'm sure. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to go in there. 
What the hell? The colours look weird. Tell to push bricks. Oh, nothing. Oh, crap. And then push bricks. I've forgotten how fiddly this thing is. I want to know why he doesn't fall down the drain. The experimenter can't measure it properly. Dear oh dear, what a hash up. And that wraps up a wonderful Flat Earth Fail Compilation 11. I do hope you enjoyed it today. If you did, then please, please do like and subscribe. It'd be thoroughly appreciated. I have been Simon Dan. Have yourselves a great weekend. And I'll see you all on Tuesday for an alien invasion. See you then. Apparently Discworld is, is the hardest. Sorry about clipping there. So I'll work my way up to Discworld. By doing all the Indianas. I don't know, Space World 6. Police Quest 6, Space Quest 6. I've seen the graphics of Space Quest 1. It's like, no thanks. But I am going to play the Commodore 64 version of Zack McCracken and Maniac Mansion. Yeah, why not? There's, there's some C64 games that I will play because they came out... Well, I played them on the Amiga. So I'm, I'm curious as to how good the graphics are on the C64. I have played Lotus Esprit on the C64. I think I might have to buy an old television and play it the way it was meant to be played. <coughs> so can I go this way? No, you've got to go that way. It's... <laughs> Here's a silly joke coming up. <coughs> I was going to say, does F5 save? No. This is FSUAE. You just go, save state. Done. Goodbye. I'm freaking out. How the hell do you play Link Between Worlds on an emulator? And a lot of times we assume that atoms are neutral. So if somebody How do you asks you move how many electrons are in oxygen, the shoes and everything. You might take a look at the periodic table, find oxygen. This number up here is the atomic number, which gives you the number of protons. You can say that there are eight protons in oxygen. Now, if we assume that we're talking about an electrically neutral oxygen, never chosen that option this before. Atom is also going to have eight electrons. Eight protons from here equals eight electrons. That assumes that the oxygen is electrically Oops. neutral. But that's not always the case. It doesn't have to be that way. For example, instead of having eight electrons, we could have <gasps> ten electrons. This oxygen could pull in two extra electrons, and in that case, it becomes an O2 minus ion. So here's the point. Atoms don't have to be electrically neutral. They can have charge. Yeah, if they are electrically neutral, then their number of Just slide down electrons, in there. they are the same. But if they're not, the protons and electrons vary, and we can get all different types of ions with that different music charges. Goes away. So, if you well, you've only played it a thousand atom, times. Different numbers of protons and electrons. You can answer that. Mean that atom could never exist. It just means that you're talking about a charged atom, 
something that has a charge. Now, how do I do this that? We're going to talk about the basics of moles. We're going to, We're still going to use a mouse. And we're going to talk about some of these important numbers and terms. Now, we're ah. going to start at the very beginning of moles here. So, no matter how much you know or okay. how much you don't know about moles, so you're going to be sitting up to play, obvious. Well, it's not obvious because with 3Ds I could just lie in bed and just relax playing it. Y weapon is X. A mole is kind of like a dozen, right? A dozen is the name for 12 things. There are 12 things in a dozen. Now, a and sword is A. 12 things in a dozen. In a mole, there are 602 exillion things. This is 602 followed by 21 zeros. 602 exillion things. So a mole, like a dozen, is a name for a certain number of things. There are 12 things in a dozen. There are 602 exillion things. It's an emulator. This is a gigantic number. Now here's one thing that confuses people about moles. They forget that a mole is a name for 602 hexillion things, and they think that a mole is an abbreviation for the word molecule. So many people think this. They see mole and they think, oh, you mean molecule. No, no, no. If I write mole, I don't mean molecule. I mean a group of 602 hexillion things, not a molecule. So there are 602 hexillion things in a mole. And just like a dozen, we can have a mole of anything. Right? So we could have a dozen donuts which would be 12 donuts. Or we could have a mole of donuts, which would be 602 hexillion donuts. Or hey, we could have jelly beans. A dozen jelly beans would be 12 jelly beans. And a mole of jelly beans would be No, because you have to sit up. It's not as fun as the so real thing. People get freaked out about moles. But just remember, they're a lot like a dozen. 12 things in a dozen, 602 hexillion This things. is only for capturing footage. It's donuts, you can have a bowl of jelly, not the way I want <laughs> to play, play the game. Rips, a bowl of bouncy balls, so for just as long as it is 600 nah. <laughs> things. Brain. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about this actual number. B is A. This number is often referred to as Avogadro's number in honor of the Italian scientist who discovered it. But now, check this out here, right? 602 hexillion. This is a gigantic number. 602 with 21 zeros after. Think about what a pain it is to deal with. Yeah, that's your right? Skyrim if trick. I pulled the wrong lever. You gotta write this out and like, do your to get multiplication more and money. 21 zeros. And weapons and Even if you're using stuff. a calculator, you got to type in all these zeros and make sure you have the right amount. And then when you get your answer, you got to go back and count how many zeros you're answering. Can you make it like it's a total pain. So instead of writing out 602 hexillion with screen? all these zeros, every time we want to talk about moles, we tend to abbreviate okay. this number. Now, as you may know, right. when we abbreviate numbers in math and science, we usually use a technique called scientific notation. Here's how we would abbreviate this number using scientific notation, okay? I've got this big number, 602 hexillion. I find out where the decimal place would be. It would be right here. And now I move the decimal place until I have just one digit to the left of it, okay? I count the number of spots. So here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, Okay, so it's not so hot at emulating a 3D. 19, 20, 21, um, 22, 23. And now this is my new spot. I'm going to play it just one through the left of it. So I move on the 3D ascent. 23 spots oh, no, no. to the left. And that means that in scientific notation, I would rewrite this number as 6.02 times 10. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't get the thing working, so my name's so one, two, three. That I moved it to the left. So six point oh two times ten to the twenty third is how we often abbreviate this gigantic number, six hundred and two hexillion, when we want to write it out and use it, say, in math class. Now, this is a convenient I've got a bone to, to pick with you. But it's also a terrible way to write it. Because this number, six point oh two times ten um, to the twenty third. 
It looks terrifying, right? It's Angry like Joe. The exponent, six point oh two times this thing. It's like people see this number and they're like, "Oh my God, what do I Everyone do?" Everyone calls so lazy, and yet yeah. he's just saved the kingdom, and he's woken up and he's on another adventure. Might look a little just a running joke? That it oh. is an abbreviation for 602 hexillion bit. Okay. It is a, it, that it is an abbreviation for this very large number here. Every time you see 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, just remember that it is an abbreviation for 602 hexillion. Okay, so now we've learned what a mole is. How many things are in a mole, and we've learned how we can abbreviate. So how do you do a bow with an Xbox controller? The last thing I want to do this is this is really intriguing. How gigantic this number, 602 hexillion, how gigantic it really is. Okay? So let's think about this mole of jelly beans that we talked about earlier. 602 hexillion jelly beans, which you know, uh, which you know now we can abbreviate as 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd jelly beans. You're going to have to make a little table for your mouse if you get a use. Use an emulator. If you had 602 hexillion jelly beans, that would be as oh, okay. large yeah, okay. as the entire planet Earth. A mole of jelly beans <gasps> as big as a planet Earth. Yeah, you can crazy. live here. Think about how many jelly beans. I mean, really. Think about of how course. many jelly beans it would be if your house were filled with jelly beans. Okay, that would be Gigantic. Oh, you're gonna Think play about up, aren't how you? Jelly beans would be every building in your town was made only of jelly beans. Okay, like that would be a ton. Now, imagine how many jelly beans you'd have if the entire Earth were made of nothing but jelly beans. And that is how big a mole. Um, I've been playing. Now, we could have also a mole of donuts, which would be six. 102 hexillion donuts, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd donuts. If we had this many donuts, Link's Awakening for so long, them on top I'm getting these two like mixed up. Which one's my favorite so Zelda game of all time? Is it this one or Link? This stack Link's Awakening. From the Earth to the Sun. Do you, do you can't have a favorite Zelda game. 200 billion. I've got them all. I like them all. From the earth to the sun, back and forth, 200 billion times. Again, think about how many donuts Sorry, I'm gonna you would be have if you just laid donuts down like this from like your house Let's to the Let's go to the school, castle and right sit on the five it. windows. Now imagine going from earth to the sun and back, 200 billion What the hell's going times. wrong with my P drive? That is how many donuts, 602x silly. Well, open them for me. But now here's the thing, this is really interesting. We're talking here about jelly beans and donuts. But a lot of times in chemistry, we're talking about... Is impasse? The one that threw me out of the castle. I'm playing through Ocarina at the same time. I'm playing through I'm playing all at once. The planet Earth. This could make a very a funny, weird is much uh, timeline. In this container, I have just about one mole of sulfur atoms, this yellow powder, these yellow chips are made entirely of sulfur atoms. And there are about 602 hexillion sulfur atoms Thanks. in this little dish here. So think about this, right? Got 600. Now, this is where you speed run the paintings. Now, 602 hexillion jelly beans would be the size of the earth. 602 hexillion sulfur atoms. Uh, yeah, I know. This shows us how absolutely What if you don't do them? A sulfur atom is how tiny all atoms are compared to a jelly bean. Really, a mole of these be the size of planet Earth, but a mole of these little sulfur atoms can fit in this dish. So when we're dealing with something as tiny as atoms, a mole doesn't actually take up that much space with the things that we're dealing with. So incredibly small, the giant number of them just actually, to be honest, so the um, let's go over Twilight Princess, uh, so a mole is kind of like a dust, of the wild, except there are 
well, a completely different Zelda game. And the only one I'm going to buy is Hyrule Warriors on Switch. Well, I might buy it when it's worth nothing, because I've collected every Zelda game. This number here, so, 602 yeah. hexillion, is often referred to as... Okay, you can come up now. And now finally, at the very end of the lesson, we saw how 602 hexillion... Nobody, will, nobody will tell me if Link is his sister or not. I'm always hinting at it. Are so tiny that a oh, hell! The cross-dressing one. So what is that? 602 and that Let's try Force Heroes. As scientists have done experiments and learned more and There's more one Zelda game I haven't played through. They changed the way they think about atoms. So in this video, we're going to look at timelines oh, of the different it? ways that Ooh, scientists worlds, have pictures heroes, or imagined atoms. Ocarina Mask. Now the first people to really know. talk about the idea oh, sorry, of atoms this is heroes. were the ancient Greek philosopher Democritus. Cross-Christian one. Hippus. They lived about 2,500 years ago. And Democritus, yeah. he said something like this. Yeah, well, he said, one imagine day. you have an object, like say a slice of bread. Play them all. And you cut that oh, no. in. And Even Link's crossbow training. Yeah, 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 you gotta play them all. And then you take half of that and you will okay. come the idea. Eventually, okay. he said, you're going to come to something. I'm happy that, that I chose to be brainwashed and into playing my first Zelda game. He called them automos, which means uncuttable, and it's where we get the word atom from. Democritus imagined that all matter, all stuff, the only two I won't ever play is uncuttable particles. And one and two. That the atoms came in different just, sizes maybe and different shapes. Imagine, for example, that iron atoms had hooks, which is how they could hold together Maybe so one day. strongly. And he thought that salt atoms had spikes on them, because he felt that salt... There's people, you know, millions shot. of speed runs. So... Uh, I just, I can't handle the, point, the graphics. But people didn't really take to his idea. Part of the reason was because around the same time, the well-known philosopher Aristotle proposed his own idea of what matter was made. He said that different things were made of different amounts. So I don't even know if I'm earth, talking. Water, air, fire, and ether. This is kind of like uh. Captain Planet, if you're old enough to get that reference. And more people they haven't been squashed yet. So. Maybe just because he was so popular already. So Democritus and Leucippus, they were right all along. But here's the no, you thing. can't run yet either. They weren't scientists. They couldn't do experiments in the laboratory to prove that they were right. And you can't lift up the rock yet either. Some people think that their idea, it was just kind of a lucky guess. They couldn't actually prove what they thought. So, you know, how can you tell whether it's right or wrong? <laughs> what the hell is it sending it to? There's no cartridge. For about 2,000 years. Until in 1808, the British chemist John Dalton came up the first scientific experiments that showed that matter was made of tiny little particles. <laughs> One, two, this three. Kind of John Dalton pictured as <gasps> imagining sort of oh, God, I'm gonna laugh at that. that arranged in different combinations to make. I'm sorry, I have to Skywalker for a second. Imagine that these atoms were THX one one three eight couldn't cut them into smaller pieces. Now, at first, nobody believed Dalton. But over the course of the 1800s, more and more scientists did begin to believe what he had to say. But then in the 1900s, the early 1900s, people I have to idea about Adams giggled by the Queen? One of the first. key things that caused this change was that in the late 1800s, J.J. Thompson discovered that atoms have electrons. And he discovered that electrons are much, much smaller than atoms. Mm. So while Dalton you need the rock atoms were lifter. tiny and indivisible, 
J.J. Thompson said, no, 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 they're not indivisible because they're made up of electrons, which are much smaller. So J.J. Thompson pictured the atom as sort of like a blueberry muffin. He called this the plum pudding model. J.J. Thompson imagined that if you took an atom and split it open, you'd see tiny electrons stuck throughout the inside of it, just the way blueberries are stuck in the dough of a blueberry muffin. And Thompson thought that what's the dough in a blueberry muffin, that it was like a positively I can't run into trees just yet. So you had negative Didn't electrons they? stuck in like a positively charged dough. Oh crap, not that. The positive and Get negative charge me. Oh. balanced. The, the two things balanced, balanced each other out so that the atom was electrically neutral. But the big change from Dalton's model to Thompson's model was showing that atoms weren't actually indivisible, that they were made of even smaller things. Now, not too much longer, in the uh, gold foil experiment, Ernest Rutherford discovered that atoms had a nucleus, that all the positive charge in an atom was concentrated right in its center, and that besides that and the electrons, atoms were pretty much empty space. So J.J. Thompson thought the positive charge Oh, okay, now I, got, I need the bar. Like dough in a muffin. All right. But Rutherford showed that all this positive stuff was concentrated right here in the center. And this is what we call the nuclear model of the atom. shield it? Have no. nucleus. Sometimes people call this the Rutherford model. Now, so far we've been talking a lot about uh, the positive charge and the nucleus of it. But we haven't talked too much about what's actually going on with these electrons in the atom. In 1913, the physicist Niels Bohr came up with his model of the atom. He reasoned that there is a nucleus in the middle, just like Rutherford had, but that electrons, instead of just sort of being randomly distributed throughout the atom, Bohr said that the electrons were sort of like planets around a sun, that they were spinning around the nucleus in circular orbits. So here are a picture of some of the electrons, and here are the orbits. Imagine that they're spinning around the nucleus in these circles. All right. Now, people thought Bohr's idea for the electrons made a lot of sense at first. But then in the 1920s, additional experiments showed that it wasn't exactly the way electrons really moved. And a variety of physicists, particularly the physicist Erwin Schrodinger, showed that electrons weren't really spinning in orbits, but it's more like they were hyperactive flies, and they were buzzing around the atom, okay, sketching sir. out different shapes. It's kind of if you did like time-lapse photography on a hyperactive fly, and you saw that over a long period of time it sketched out a particular design. And no. Oh, hell no. Bohr called these circular paths, he called them orbits. What stupid freaking owl. called the hyperactive sketch-out shapes, he called them orbitals. Here's a circular orbital, too. Okay, but so how do I... only make circles. This is actually a sphere, because it's a circle in three dimensions. Here is another shape, another Why? type of orbital that electrons X. could also make, looks like this, okay. are two teardrops next to each other. So in the quantum mechanical model, Good electrons shot. don't orbit the nucleus. I, I got a sniper scope for my the atom bow and Skyrim, but different shapes. it sucks. Now let's focus on the nucleus here. Over the same amount of time, and a little bit later, scientists were discovering the two subatomic particles that make up the nucleus. So we can refine this picture a little bit more. In 1919, Ernest Rutherford discovered protons. Oh shit, my controller's gone dead. And then in 1932, James Chadwick discovered neutrons. So the really correct view of the quantum mechanical model shows the orbitals being sketched out by the electrons, but then also shows the subatomic particles, protons, and neutrons here in the nucleus. Fuck. Now, 
This is pretty much how we think about atoms today. But as scientists learn more and more about atoms, as they do more experiments, they're going to find that this model isn't exactly a charge representation <laughs> of what atoms are really like. And Expressive. they're quite likely to change this and refine it even more. Now, as I said, this quantum mechanical model is like the really accurate way to describe atoms. But the thing is with these orbitals, it can really be kind of right, Zarathustra's castle? to describe simple things that atoms are doing using electron orbitals. And so a lot of times in these videos, when I talk about atoms, I'm actually going to be sort of using a cross between the very correct quantum mechanics. I need a shield. And the sort of outdated Bohr model. Just because for our purposes, a lot of the simple things we're going to be talking about, the Bohr model, it works just fine. So already you've probably seen me draw atoms like this, where you see the, the electron orbits at different angles. And sometimes, particularly when we're talking about bonds, we're going to be drawing atoms like this, with the protons and neutrons here in the nucleus, and then electrons in different rings, different orbits on the outside of the atom. We're going to find uh. thinking about the atom like this is very useful for simple tasks, talking about bonding and stuff. But keep in mind that when we're discussing atoms, they actually are oh, exactly like this. Piece of crap. They're much more like the quantum mechanical model. So keep in mind that I'm lying to you a little bit, but I'm lying to you in order to make it easier to convey some fundamental topics. All right, sir, what are you we're up to? Talk a lot about electrons. No, oh, I'll so far we're going to start out looking at an atom and looking at the space. There you are. What are you doing in the Eastern Palace? Then we'll learn about the most important type of electrons in an atom. These are called the valence electrons. We'll learn how you can figure out how many valence electrons an atom has by uh -huh. looking at this where that you speak atom of. is on the periodic table. And finally, so we'll take an atom and draw so one of the electron dot diagrams for it that shows how many electrons it has. So let's get started. OK, so check out this diagram. Whatever, that dude. In the middle is the nucleus. I'll see a rotting corpse in a few minutes. Now look at all of these little circles. Each one of these circles B is a. a spot that could hold one electron. You can think of these as like parking spots for electrons or like theater seats for electrons. And these spots for electrons no. organize <laughs> into these stupid. circles. These circles are called energy levels or shells. You can think of these energy levels or shells sort of like they show the path that the electrons would take as they're spinning around the nucleus here. But also, energy levels or shells arrange electrons into different groups that are varying distances from the center. OK, like so for this first group, this first energy level or shell can hold two electrons really close to the nucleus. Moving out a little bit, we get to another shell that can hold eight electrons, and they're spinning out here. And then even further out, we have another oh, shell that can hold eight electrons. Now it keeps going from here, and there are more and more energy levels or shells. Okay, but it's not it the game blocking up the so state. I just wanted to focus on these first three to give you an idea of how they Stupid. work. Stupid. Now. If you've learned a little bit about atoms already, you might know that the way I've drawn this here, this isn't the most perfectly accurate way try. to represent electrons and atoms. But you know what? It doesn't matter. For our purposes right now, we just want to learn the basics. Drawing and thinking about atoms like this is totally fine. So don't worry that it's not super accurate. OK, so let's look at what happens when we start filling these electron parking spaces when we start filling them with actual electrons. So we're going to use the periodic table for this. We'll go column by column. And here's what I'm doing. I've made this big version of a periodic table. And you can see it looks a little bit different than the real version of a periodic table, OK? Look at this whole thing in the middle. This is sort of a, 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 a big, real periodic table. We're not going to worry about any of these elements in here in the middle. So this whole section. I put it here, 
just gotten rid of it. We're not going to worry about it. We're only going to focus on eight columns. We're going to focus on these two right here, which I've drawn there, skipping everything in the middle, and then we're going to focus on these six over here. So don't get confused by the way I've drawn this. We're just leaving out some of the elements that we don't want to get into right now. Okay, so let's take the first element right here, hydrogen. Now, how many electrons are there in hydrogen? Okay, well, what we got to do is we've got to look it up on the periodic table, and we're going to find something like this. Now, the periodic table, it doesn't actually tell us how many electrons are in hydrogen. It's got this one here, but that refers to the number of protons. Can you play a bit of an Xbox controller? In hydrogen, that's what its atomic number is. Now, I don't want to be, assume, I don't though, be sitting up. This hydrogen atom, it's hurting my back. It doesn't have a charge then the number of electrons is going to equal the number of protons. So hydrogen always has one proton, but if the atom is neutral, it doesn't have a charge, it will also have one electron. So let's go back to this diagram of the atom here. Let's just start with this first energy level, okay? Here's a drawing just the first energy level. Let's put a nucleus in here. I'm not actually going to draw the proton. Oh, crap. Time. Instead, I'm just going to write the number of protons. I lost that heart. One oh, proton, God. And P plus oh, is dear. the division for protons. So one P plus in the nucleus. Now here are the two spots in this first energy level where electrons can live. There is one electron in hydrogen. So we're going to fill that in. That was really easy, right? So we've got this first energy level in hydrogen. One of the spots is still empty. And one of the spots is full. <gasps> okay. Let's move down here to lithium. Now, if we look up lithium on the periodic table, we're going to see this three, which means that oh, God. lithium atom has three protons. Oh. But if that lithium atom is neutral, which we always assume it is when we're doing this sort of thing, oh. this lithium atom you also has die. three electrons. Oh, my God. So, we'll start here. We'll be first concerned with this, uh, uh, this energy level that's right here, the first one here. I'm going to put a nucleus in here, three well, P plus, because Why? there are three protons in here. Okay, so there are three electrons. So this one is going to get filled, and this one is going to get filled. And now we're going to want to go to the next I'm energy level. Go. Okay, now that starts getting filled. So now play it's much like this. Now we want to start thinking about the I'm second energy slow. level. The first one is filled, and now one electron is going to go here in the second energy level. Okay? So these energy levels... They're really like parking spaces. Imagine that the nucleus is a mall, right? It's like the parking spaces closest to the entrance hall, those are the ones that fill up first. And then as more and more people park, the empty parking spaces move further key, and buddy. further and further away from the center of the mall. It's exactly the same way with atoms, okay? The first energy levels close to the nucleus, those are the ones that are going to fill up. And then after they're full, the other energy levels further out, they're going to begin to fill up. Oh, not okay. this level. Now, let's look at sodium. Elf, here we sodium are. has I got no 11 shield. protons in its nucleus, 11 P plus, and we're going to assume that since it's neutral, we're assuming that it's neutral, it has the same number of electrons as protons. So let's start filling them in. One, two in the first energy level. Now that's full, so we're going to start filling the second energy level. Three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, and finally these are all full, but we still have more electrons. So now we're going to have to bump it to the third energy level. Here's a third energy level that we can start filling in. Ten of these are already living there, so we're going to add one more. And now there's oh. one Ooh. in this third energy. I level. forgot I can't okay. jump from this game. Check this out because this is important. Hydrogen, lithium, and sodium. They all have different numbers of electrons. But there's a pattern here. Check this out. Each one of these atoms has one electron in the outermost Easiest shell. Boss okay? pedal this, one's full, this one's full, but then there's just one here. This one's full, and then there's just one here. And then Semi -boss. only has one energy level. A half a boss. This has one electron. I don't know. These electrons, one, one, and one, these are the valence electrons. That's the, the big key. important <coughs> electrons in an atom. We'll talk more about that later, why they're so important. But all you have to know for right now is that the valence electrons 
are the electrons. I'm not playing this on my emulator. That is the furthest after the first the boss. Nucleus. So in this atom, the valence energy level is the third, and it has one electron. And here, the valence energy level, the, the furthest out, is the second. And here, the furthest out, the valence energy level, is the first. So there's a pattern. Each one of these atoms has one valence electron. That's true, not just for these first three atoms, but for every one of the atoms that's in this first column. That's the easiest level I didn't want to do the electron um, structures for all of these others, but just trust me. Oh, this is where she blinks, yeah. Okay. okay. So now there's a way that we want to be able to write that to show that these elements have one valence electron. So you didn't want to go so back to Zarathustra, you freak. We call these electron dot freak in a yellow tank. Sometimes known as Lewis diagrams, where we put the you element again. and then put one dot over it to show that it has one valence electron. Here's how we'd write the electron dot diagram for all the elements that are in this column. As an example, I'll just take lithium and write it here. So every single atom in this column has one valence electron. Okay, let's move on and take a look at some of the other columns on a periodic table. Okay, so everything here has one valence electron. Let's take a look at this column. Starting with beryllium, beryllium has four protons. If it's electrically neutral, it's going to have four electrons as well. So let's look at how this fills in. Uh, we've got four protons here in the nucleus, and now we're going to go one, two in the first energy level, and in the second energy level, three, four. Okay, so I've never played this game so good. Electrons in the outer energy level, and look at the way I fill them in. I didn't just fill them in clockwise here, but one went on the top, and then one went on the bottom. Even without okay. a shield. Now magnesium, magnesium here has an atomic number of twelve, so twelve protons and 12 electrons, if we assume that it is electrically neutral, 12p plus here. So, 12, 1, ah. 2, 3, 4, 5, Damn it. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, Got 12. So what's the pattern here? For this second column in the periodic table, we've got two valence electrons for magnesium in the third energy level, and we have two valence electrons for beryllium in the second energy level. So everything in this column has two valence electrons in this outermost shell. So what we can do is we can draw electron diagrams for everything in the second shell here. I'm sorry, for everything in the second column here. And it looks like this. We take the element symbol and then we put a dot at the top and a dot at the bottom. And that's how we represent the electrons for here. So I'll just do like BE beryllium for an example. I'll do BE dot on the top, dot on the bottom. Let's go on. Okay, you're probably getting the hang of this, so we're going to start moving a little bit faster. Let's move on to boron here. Here's boron. This is the structure of boron. And then here is aluminum down here. 13, pro I'm sorry, five protons, 13 protons. And look at what the structure of the valence electrons is here. We've got one, two, three in the valence shell of boron. And for aluminum, we've got Back one, two, soul. three in the valence shell. The same is true for these guys here, even though I haven't drawn them out. So if, in your, if you're in this column, you have three valence electrons. An example of this would be boron. And look at how I do the dots for boron. Okay, I do a dot on the top, just like lithium, uh, wrong a dot side. on the bottom, just like beryllium, and then I do a dot here to the left to show that these all have three valence electrons, and it would be the same way for any of the elements in this column here. Okay, let's do all of these as a group, okay? This column first has carbon and silicon. And each of these have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four valence electrons in their outer shell. Okay? So I can take this and do a dot up here, a dot down here, a dot to the left, and then a dot to the right to show mm -hmm. that everything in this column has I should be able to buy a bottle now. Valence electrons. Now moving on to the right, 
We've got this column with nitrogen and phosphorus and all these others, and everything here has one, two, three, four, five. One, two, I three, get those four, ones, five valence electrons. So if nitrogen is my example, I'm going to do N, dot on the top, dot on the bottom, left, right, and now I start doubling up. So now there are going to be two dots on the top of nitrogen to show that there are five valence electrons for everything that's in this column. You can probably see that there's a pattern that's developing here. Oxygen and sulfur each have, you can count them, six valence there. electrons. So I'll take oxygen as an example. Now look at what I do here for drawing the valence electrons because it gets a little bit tricky. You'll figure out that it's a little bit tricky. Okay, dot on the top. So anyway, six valence electrons for everything in this column. Oxygen is the example. Dot on the top, oh. dot on the bottom, dot on the left, dot on the right. Now bucks. we double up the one on the top, and then we double up the one on the right. Okay, so we don't put it on the bottom, we put it on the right. So up, down, left, right, and then around clockwise. Finally, for this column, which has at the top of it fluorine huh? and chlorine, Am I both important? of these have seven valence electrons, which means that this valence shell is almost full, except for one. <coughs> So I'll take fluorine as my example here. Dot on the top, He's a dick. dot on the bottom, dot on the left, dot on the right. Now we double up. Double up on the top, two up here. Double up on the right, two there. And then double up on the bottom. So I've only got one guy here on the left that doesn't have a pair. <sighs> now here's the last column that we're going to talk about. Okay? Look at what happens here. We're going to look at helium, neon, and argon. Okay? Here's helium, here's neon, and here is argon. Notice that argon has eight valence electrons, doesn't have any empty holes in its valence shell. Neon also has eight valence electrons, but helium only has two valence electrons. Okay? So what's going on in this column is that most of Not these it. have eight. Neon has eight, argon has eight, as do krypton, xenon, and radon. But then there's helium that only has two. But regardless of whether you have two, I mean, of whether you have eight or whether you have two, if you're in this column, your valence shell is totally full. Okay? So here it's full with eight, here it's full with eight, and here it's full with two. But they're all full, and there aren't any empty holes in the shells. So as an example, I'm going to use neon, which has eight. So one, two, three, four, and now we go clockwise. Five, six, seven, eight. Eight valence electrons for most of these guys, but remember that helium only shield. has two valence electrons, but that all of them have valence shells that are totally full with no empty spots. So this kind of sums up everything that we talked about. Every atom in this column has one valence electron. Every atom in this column has two valence electrons. And then we skip over this middle section, and we get three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So if you know which of these columns a particular atom is in, you can figure out how many valence electrons it has. What are isotopes? Isotope is a word that gets thrown around in chemistry a lot. So like, I think he's only got a bottle at the moment. Really quickly. Isotopes are different versions of an element, or different versions yeah. of a certain kind of element. This can be a tricky concept, though, and a lot of people get confused by isotopes. So I want to describe them by starting out with an analogy, cars, okay? I want to talk to you about the made-up car okay. called the Lomoni. Okay, that's enough for today. The epitome of the uh, and it's known for its very distinctive style. I'll play this sitting up. Now, the Lamona comes in three different models. There's the Lamona G, the Lamona GX, and the Lamona GXL. They're all different colors, as you can see, but each of these models.